without further ado, let's get started. Hello, um, so uh, this is so exciting to be here, and uh, let's go talk compost. Uh, so this is the uh, timeline, how we started, and we started a long time ago in 2015, and we started with the uh, program Leaves Nature Treasures. And what this was uh, about is about mulching, mowing leaves and keeping the leaves on the property, utilizing, returning the nutrients from the leaves back to the soil instead of pushing them to the curb and asking the town to pick them up and take them somewhere else. So then we realized that, well, you know, there are some properties which have a lot of trees and uh, we may not be able to incorporate all those uh, shredded leaves into the soil and the soil may not be able to absorb it. So what to do with the excess? Composting. So that's how composting was born in Greenwich. And in summer 2015, uh, we received, a, we started with the pilot program. So we approached two of the most friendly schools. And I was talking to the principals only because I knew that if I'm going to go to the Board of Education, there will be red tapes all over and probably going to take me five years to even start it. So I just approached two schools and I said, can we do a, a pilot program? They said uh, yes, and then we were lucky because DEP had this grant for recycling and we were able to uh, uh, kind of convince them that uh, food recycling is also important and we have to start thinking about it. They liked it, they gave us $20,000. The $20,000 went to build composters at school, we built 11 of them, uh, 10 uh, in public schools and one uh, in private school. And also we bought 250 uh, uh, smaller composters, yard composters, and we train every property owner how to compost. So basically I would come to the site, set up the composter, shred the leaves for them, and they had no excuse to not compost. I let them own out. <laughs> At spring 2020, uh, two additional composters were added to the program because we still have three schools which didn't have composters. Two of them said yes, one of them remained stubborn. Uh, so we did apply to Sustainable Connecticut Community Match Fund and we received the money and we, um, we got the composters. Uh, now the current uh, program is leaning towards uh, the food scrap uh, pickup and collection because it is actually... Okay. Ooh, good news. Okay, we're gonna get to a more comfortable, larger room. The food scraps, uh, such as uh, cooked food, we couldn't put them out into the composters because they were um, uh, attract rats and other rodents. So uh, we're just uh, limited to uh, fruits and vegetables. But with the food scrap collection and curbside pickup, we actually can collect all of the organic material, and this really makes a huge impact on the waste of diversion. So here are our start, and uh, we have the ribbon cutting ceremony. There's the first selectman to the right, and uh, the principal of the school to the uh, to the left, and that's how we started. And uh, why composting uh, at school? Probably all of you can answer this question. It is beneficial for the sustainability of the school, establishes good habits in students. They are our future, so they're supposed to be trained how to do it, not only at home but also at school. They are supposed to have those movements to recycle. Uh, obviously, uh, we're recycling the nutrients, why to lose them, um, save the money, and create awareness uh, around recycling and composting. So here, how it was done. So the, the program started with talking to the schools, to principals. I put the board of education because I don't want to kind of direct you into the wrong way. I, I did not talk to the board of education because they will kill my program. Uh, the very helpful people were PTA, and in Greenwich we have Green School Committee. So one person, one parent from each school uh, represents uh, each school, and they form the committee, and they are just focusing on environmental issues at schools. And they were really, really helpful. So Parks and Recreation, I was uh, uh, fortunate to have them. They constructed the bins for me. The students received training at the cafeteria, and we did this two different ways. So there was an option either to have slides, and we will give the slides to the school, and then each teacher will introduce those slides and go over how we compost at school. Uh, and this was actually more powerful because this came from their teachers, so the students were more obeying the program. Or the other uh, option was in cafeteria. We have five minutes in the, at the very beginning of the lunch, and we were training each group. We had usually a movie or a PowerPoint, or if we couldn't, 
didn't do any of those. We just speak to the students and we would just tell them funny story and, and tell them why it's so important. And especially the elementary school, the students, they were wonderful. They were taking care of worms and they were feeding worms. They were bringing a lot of uh, compost to the bins. The other composter, the composters, uh, stayed uh, outside and after the school was over, I was usually in charge of uh, managing them. So I will go to Ranch High School and I will get some volunteers. I will instruct them how to uh, manage the compost. So we will be uh, mixing the compost. Also, we'll make sure that it's decomposing fast enough. Summertime is, is tough because it's very dry. So the bacteria and the organisms which usually work on compost are not that active. So sometimes if the worst comes to worst, we'll go to Starbucks, we'll get the coffee grounds. And once you add this, this is an expediter. It will usually do the job. So by the end of the summer, the compost was ready and the bacteria recreation will come and they will take out the compost and it will be applied to the vegetable gardens at school. Um, uh, so here's some details because probably you'd like to know how to and how they look like. So uh, the dimension was five height and then we had three compartments and they were all six by six and uh, three because in two of them we had leaves stored and that was our carbon source and then the active one was usually to the left and so the way we were doing it, we will create a layer of leaves and then we'll bring the scraps from cafeteria and then we'll take the leaves to cover the scraps again. Why this was important? Because uh, if you know something about composting, carbon and nitrogen have to interact in order to make compost or make fast compost. So uh, we were just layering them, then you didn't have to trim the compost that much because they had uh, perfect contact between each other. And also covering with leaves, you will kind of uh, see this, like the compost was pretty because it had this mulch leaves and nobody's seen it was going on underneath. And also I uh, kind of didn't attract the rodents. So that was a good method. Um, and then uh, as you can see, the bins have a lot of opening so the air and the water can flow in. Moisture is very important and is also important for the composting. Uh, and then uh, we did uh, do the uh, rubber proofing and uh, it was easy to maintain. So why we actually make those openings that wide? Because uh, when the parks and recreation camp, they used Bobcat and they wanted just to scoop the compost and take it to the garden. They didn't want to do this by hand. And those plants in the front that all uh, could be removed, you can just push them up, take them out and the bobcat can come, come and can scoop and that, that's why the dimensions uh, were designed this way. So it was perfect design and you can see here the cost um, that was before COVID, probably now you have to uh, do two times and this is for actually treated wood. If you would like to do cedar, probably you have to go three times the price. But here's the, the, the design um, and also the, uh, the sliding so you can see that you could remove those planks in the front totally and you can open this up or you can only remove a few of them so if you have shorter students and they would like to bring the compost they will be able to reach um, also it's good for uh for managing the compost uh rather than proof i think this was a little bit overkill and i don't know whether or not this needs to be done the first composter the principal was very worried about rodents so we did the chicken wire on the top we did chicken wire in the in the back um, but actually we never, never had any problem with rodents. So rodents are nocturnal, so they're doing their job at night, nobody see. Uh, but I never seen any food being dragged outside of the bins. One day when I was maintaining and turning compost, I, I met a uh, family of mice. Uh, but they were just kind of hiding in the compost. I don't think they were, were harmful. And you know, that was uh, part of the decomposers, so uh, I did not worry about it at all. The setup in cafeteria, so uh, we uh, tried to do all the waste diversion as much as we could. So we had uh, uh, four bins, one was for compost, one was for recyclables, one was for trash, and one was for liquid. Actually, if you, uh, re you may not realize that liquid is a huge weight in your uh, waste. 
And then the table, that was shared table, and uh, whatever something was not open or um, still available to, to be eaten, uh, will be left on this table and then we'll take it to the refrigerator and we'll just leave it for the end of the day. And guess what? All this food all this always disappeared. And even Greenwich, which uh, really has a high income, uh, will still have uh, hungry kids coming to school. So here, um, uh, the, my favorite school, Riverside School, uh, they work with us from the very beginning and they actually modified this whole cafeteria. So basically what they did, instead of having those ugly open bins, they actually put nice cabinets and uh, sorry for the picture, you cannot see this clearly, but you can see the arrows and the arrow is uh, showing an opening in the countertop and then underneath you have a bin and this is all built into the cabinet so you don't see the mess and uh, it really works nice and uh, it's, it is aesthetically pleasing. Uh, location is it's, uh, very important how you locate your bins. You have to make sure that it's convenient. You have to make sure that students don't have to uh, cross busy uh, highway uh, so it's safe. Um, it's supposed to be farther away from the building because sometimes you may have some smell. Uh, and uh, partial shade, you don't want to have full sun exposure. Again, drying up is not good for the compost. High temperature is being internally made, so not really that helpful. Uh, far away from trees, so one of my composters were kind of in the wooded situation and uh, uh, when there was the time to take the compost out, it was all bonded by a root system and we couldn't even move it. Um, put it on the soil, not an asphalt, because the organisms from the soil are supposed to come and help you to do the work. Um, so the opportunities here, uh, the first picture shows our volunteer and actually uh, this guy, his name is Luke, and he did his Eagle project, and he built two of our composters, and one of them was built for his own high school. This is the, the next one shows you the vegetable garden, so we were using compost there and growing beautiful vegetables. The last one shows you the uh, one of the events where we were talking about worm composting. All students love worms, and they actually learn the biology and they learn how it works. It, well, it's really uh, interesting and good to work with it. And uh, the composting uh, also met a lot of challenges. So my biggest challenge were custodians. Custodians are supposed to be the ones who are supposed to be taking out the compost at the end of the day. They were all unionized and they said, this is not in my job description. I said, well, this is part of the garbage management, so how is not? But uh, they refused to actually do this. And once one of them started in one school, all the schools did the same thing. And then, you know, trying to do this with teachers and volunteers is kind of patching the hole. So in some programs because of it, <coughs> in some schools because of it, the program fell apart. Uh, compost contamination, you, you may think it's a big problem. Not really, <coughs> because uh, when the compost is done, you can always see it and all the plastic stuff and not wanted things usually will see, uh, stay on the sieve and you can easily remove it. Not a big problem. And then lack of short to last, I mean uh, long lasting support. So in the beginning, everybody's so, super excited, but then when you continue, and me not being uh, fully uh, have full access to schools, it was really sometimes difficult to manage this. Um, and then uh, you know our scraps uh, only fresh fruits and vegetables, so it wasn't a huge percentage of it. And then busy schools, uh, they have so much on their, on their plate and we're, they will always push you back, saying, well, this is another problem, we really don't have time or um, staff to work on it. And that's it. So, I think that's Okay, thank you, thank you. Next up, Virginia. So this is the progression of um, the school composting system started in 1997 at one elementary school and expanded to the two other elementary schools and then a middle school. And I work for the town of Mansfield, which has a population of uh, 25,000 people. If you include UConn, um, if you don't include UConn, it's about 12,000, 11,000 residents. So um, it's a pretty small school system. We have one high school and it's regional and I've just kind of given up on trying to include them in, in a lot of things. So um, they are um, 
although they are participating in the NOAA program. So it's been incremental steps. We began with one school. It was a pilot. I, I'm a firm believer in pilots. I'm a firm believer in um, also steering committees. And the steering committee that we had was the principal. And the reason why we started with one school was because I asked the principal who would like to start composting. And one principal, thankfully, out of the four said we would. So um, it was a principal, parents, the custodian, and myself. And I think there was a couple students involved as well. So we started with that. And the first thing we began with was recycling milk cartons because they weren't recycling those at lunchtime. So we were gathering the milk, and we were recycling the cartons. And that, um, when that got phased in, then we went to the next step, which was collecting the kitchen scraps and then composting that in a backyard compost bin. And from there, we went to um, getting a grant for an earth tub composter. And we used that for several years. It was a bigger, this is not the earth tub, so let me go back to here. Um, it was a bigger in-vessel compost bin that we got. We had applied for this grant to get a tiny in-vessel composter. And when we finally got the grant, the company said, oh, well, we, we faced that one out. But we have this bigger one that you could, you could use. So we were like, okay. Um, we'll use that, and then we'll invite the other two schools to contribute their food scraps. So that's what we did. We had a custodian bring the, the leftover food or the food scrapings from plates, from trays, um, to the other school. And so we, that's how we started the other elementary schools. And then we shamed the middle school into composting. Not, not something I suggest, but to this day they still compost. And that was not my intention. It was a parent that uh, shamed them into it, but I got the fallout from that. So this is what, similar to what Alex had shown, this is what um, was built by our public works department and, and uh, of an elementary school compost bin. So one side was the active pile and the other side was empty, so I would turn the pile into the the second one. So the one one side, the left side, would always be the active pile, um, and that was for the elementary schools. We didn't have airspace between the front, but the compost bin was lined with hardware cloth, with a quarter inch or half inch uh, hardware cloth to prevent rodents from getting in and also the tops were open. They also had hardware cloth. And the strings that you see there are attached to a, a counterweight, so if you lifted the lid, it stayed open. Um, the, the compost bins were designed, like what Alex was talking about, for a tractor to get in to turn it. When we first started the middle school, we had students and families turning the pile, but as those uh, students graduated from the middle school, it was hard finding parents to, 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 and families to take this on, so we just went with the tractor. And that seemed to work fine, um, you know, for, for the many years that we did that. So this is an example of the, the counterweighted lid. We actually, in this picture, um, you can see there's a, a barbell weight <laughs> on that and a cinder block. It wasn't fancy, but it worked. You know, you lifted it open. And I did, I did um, try with putting a corrugated top on it, that's the corrugated top, because we were getting so much rain. And what was, the thing that was the issue with the school compost piles in these bins is they go anaerobic. I didn't have any kind of uh, venting, although I did try that, but I didn't have any like forced air through them. And I would go, I finally gave up on custodians. You know, they'll do, like Alex was saying, they'll do their part, which is dump it in the compost bin and, and cover it. You know, that was a big hurdle, but they wouldn't manage it at all. So I'd go to the schools once a week and uh, turn the compost. So um, 
it would still be, it would still get anaerobic as the year, school year went on and the pile got bigger, the bottom part would just be anaerobic. So you see um, students helping with screening the compost and that was a yearly thing at all the schools. We'd have them involved in screening the compost and the schools would use um, the finished compost with their greenhouses. Uh, once, two schools actually had a very active plant sale, so the compost was actually used to start seeds. I know you're not supposed to do that, but they did. And uh, because of the, um, it could pass on uh, fungal issues and, and um, you know, for the tender, tender stems that could then break off. Um, and they would use it in plantings around the school. So the students were involved, particularly at the beginning of this process. As the years went on, it was like less and less student involvement was happening. It was harder to get um, teachers, at least one teacher, engaged with the process. So for the middle school, at the beginning, when in 2000, they did set up a a web page that was through a grant that I had gotten through Connecticut DEP, and uh, we created the web pages which have activities on it. And so there were there was a club that uh, was involved with this and and did some of those activities. And teachers were invited to use those activities as well. And then we created a school composting manual. So that is that is out there. Um, so in 2020, when was the pandemic? <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's when, that's when we went from off-site, on-site to on, off-site composting. And the reason for that was because I was saying the pile was getting anaerobic. So it was really hard to keep um, the pile from stinking because I did try those perforated PVC pipes, but that just wasn't cutting it. So um, we went with, and still are doing this to, to this day, collecting it in carts. Um, I've been the person who's been picking it up and dumping it at the leaf pile at the transfer station. I did have to get a demonstration uh, project permission from DEP, so there's a cost to that. It was $500 to do it. Um, and then I had to keep track, which I do anyhow, of the amount of food scraps that we were collecting and how the pile was going. So it's just added to our leaf pile at the transfer station. And the beauty of it is, is that it gets covered very well with leaves, which when it was on site at the schools, bulky material was always the limiting factor, it seemed. And because uh, the custodians never put enough cover on, on the food. And we also have equipment there. So this loader is what is covering, once I dump the food scraps, it's covering the pile up with leaves. And I see a big rock in there too. Um, but I've moved upstream as well. Like how, are, and I, I've been trying to do this for years, but I now have a receptive audience in the uh, food service director. She's lovely. I'm in love with her because she's totally on the same page as I am, which is let's get the waste out of the lunch. So as you can see here, this is like a typical uh, amount of contamination found in the food scraps. You know, you see a lot of this. See the ketchup packets and the portion cup containers and chip bags and condiment, I see maple syrup, con those little white condiment packets and, and plastic forks. Now the schools have been using washable trays and forks and spoons, but I wanted to expand that. So I've got a receptive audience in the food service director. So we've been um, switching to uh, food that is served on non-toxic, because the melamine trays that uh, the schools were using uh, actually, they, they leach out formaldehyde if you have acidic foods or um, hot foods. So <laughs> they're really not the best option for washable containers, okay. And so um, they now have dispensers for condiments, they now have dispensers for milk, 
and the pork sensibilities which they've been using. So we are transitioning to washable and non-toxic food service. And that has been huge in terms of how much contamination is in the food scraps. It was always pretty low. It was always about one to three percent, which is phenomenal if you ask any um, compost facility. But um, it's even less now. And so what the new lunch line looks like is um, that this here is for the cups and the the cart is for trays, forks, and any stainless steel cups. Um, other waste prevention activities, so the food service uh, person is really committed to more cooking on site, so less prepackaged stuff, buying local produce, so it's, it's fresh, it's delicious. And we have a local dairy, so we're getting milk from the local dairy, which is awesome. Also having kids try different so they, they, like fennel, you know, who would think, right? They're, they're tasting these foods that they might never be exposed to. Um, share tables are very important. And this year we started collecting leftovers from the kitchen. So that share table, if there's anything that's left from that share table, it goes to our local soup kitchen. So the high school is involved with that. So that's my end with the high school. So let's see where we get with the high school, maybe with the composting. Um, and here's my information and the link to the manual and the link to the web page that the middle school has. So thank you. Scraps, as I said, with a piece of plywood on the bottom and a tarp under it, just to then 
make cleanup easier because it does get messy, especially dealing with 13 to 15 eighth graders who want to have a lot of fun and throw food at each other sometimes. So after that, we look at our worm bin, we feed them, we feed our worm bins, we make sure to see if they've been eating, if they're not eating, what foods they like. We can notice they really like pineapple more than anything. And then usually at the last 15 minutes, we do an activity and that could also change. For example, this year I'm really excited because we're gonna look at compost under a microscope at its different stages and it's the compost with soil and just normal soil around their garden to see what it looks like under a microscope. So that might take 45 minutes, so we would have to do all this beforehand without the students so they have time to do the other activity. So it really changes on a week to week basis. And here you will see this is what their lab report, lab sheet kind of looks like. So they can write this down every week. So every Monday they'll get there, they have a thermometer, they take the temperature, they then do the bulk density, they fill up a bucket, they weigh it, they multiply it by 40, then they add their gallons of water to see how much it is, to see what, ex what specific maintenance we need to do to our pile that week. And then at the bottom they also have their key to make sure they know if they're in the ranges, if they're not in the ranges and whatnot. Also in this picture compared to our previous, there's a change up in this third bin, which is our curing stage. So this is our mixing bay, this is our phase two mixing bay after the 10 weeks, and then this is our curing, which stays there over the summer, which we then sit sometimes with the new students. So what we did this year was, over the summer this year, we added wood chips to the bottom so that the uh, drain pipes can actually breathe and they're not getting smooshed in. And then we added the compost from the second bay into that third bay, and we have an electric blower that we bring every week when we do our maintenance on Mondays and we throw it in there and let it shoot air for 10, 15 minutes just to help us with the mixing because we also have some core screws that we mix in if we don't want to take everything out. So that's kind of how the front end looks with the students. And then some tips for when you're dealing with the actual school side of it. It's to honestly have a lot of communications with whoever you're dealing with, maybe the custodians, maybe with teachers, maybe with the admin, maybe with the facilities people and especially the kitchen, because the school that we work with, the kitchen prepares all the food for the kids, and it's, a, it's all farm to table. They don't really deal with any packaging, so the plastics are really low, and we talk with the kitchens, and we give them a printout of like stickers that they can have, so they know what can go into their compost bin that they take outside. So we try to avoid the oils, the meats, the dairy products, milks, and all that stuff, just because we don't want rodents to come in or have odors because it's in the school garden, which is actually right next to the school. It's not very separated. And then as well as with the facility, we don't want to give the custodians any more work. So we are the ones actually doing all the mixing in this case. And we really only talk to facilities or the custodians if we need something fixed that we don't have right there on site. Like if a piece of, if a nail is out, it's not screwed, we ask them for a screwdriver or something like that. And then, Really what we want to do with this is to prove to schools and students and parents that composting is fun, composting is easy, and composting is super good for us. And that's kind of what we want to show them with these classes every week. Get the kids, in, get them engaged and excited about composting, which is something that we've seen. As well as at the end of the 30 weeks, we give them a certificate after, and they become compost apprentices, because after 30 weeks of actually doing this whole scientific thing, they are apprentices. Us. Um, they get a review sheet every 10 weeks that kind of reviews topics like anaerobic versus aerobic, what is thermophilic, thermophilic, what is mesophilic, what are the benefits of each, what is actinobacteria, what is bulk density, and all that fun stuff. And then finally, before you actually do your site prep and everything, you kind of want to know how much food you're dealing with, how much space you're dealing with, because maybe they don't produce enough food for you to then create a three-base system, a mesophilic system, and a bourbon compost bin. So maybe you just need to have a three-base system. Or maybe you just have a worm bin in each of their classes and make it easier so the kids can actually get involved. Um, also, your carbon sources, where you're going to get them, if you're going to store them in the school or you're going to bring them every week like we do. We bring two bins of leaves, wood chips, and wood shavings just so it's easier. And if we can't mix the food in, we can throw the food in those bins. 
And then materials. Do you need tools? Does the school have tools? Do you need tarps? We use tarps to then put on the bottom and also to cover the piles on top just for an extra layer of protection as well as adding wood chips to the top of each layer. And finally, how will you mix? If they have a concrete pad, do you need to bring the plywood? Do you need to bring tarps to make it easier? Those are just things to think beforehand so it's once you get there it runs smoothly and everything works perfectly. And finally, some resources that we used a lot is the New York City Master Composting Manual and the Mansfield. So, I don't know if Virginia knows, but I've been emailing her and I don't know if she realizes that's actually me. So these two are actually great resources for activities and teaching material that you can use depending on what grade you have. And I gained a lot of insight from the Mansfield and New York and working with the science teacher to apply what we're doing in compost class with what they're doing in school so they get they actually see the actual real life application of science. And if you have any questions you can email us or look at our website. And I'll open the door. Questions?